Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, so, probably in contrast to most of you, I'm not a developer. Nonetheless, I code from time to time. I'm an assistant professor in computer science in Linköping University in Sweden. And what I want to talk about is this paper that we uh, wrote. So, basically, uh, most of the talk is based on this paper, uh, which is joint work with my colleague and friend, Jorge Perez, uh, from the University in Chile. And as you can imagine, this is a very math-heavy piece of work. In fact, uh, in a recent blog post about this paper, somebody commented this. Your article sounds highly relevant and useful, but a bit too terse for a simpleton like me when you can't read the mathemati mathematical notations. Could you please explain what the algorithm does in plain English? So I'm taking the challenge now of trying to explain to you in very simple words uh, some of the highlights of this work that we did. And let me start with a bit of motivation. Why would somebody study the GraphQL language or some query language in general formally? And um, first of all, it may allow us to highlight intrinsic limitations of all possible implementations of this language. So this would not be um, limitations of one particular implementation. Instead, this would be um, limitations due to everybody implementing the spec. Um, it may allow us to identify optimization opportunities, of course, and perhaps also very important, um, it allows us to clarify possible corner cases, which is what we need formalisms for. So we'll find uh, examples for all of this in the rest of the talk. And this is, in a nutshell, uh, what we did in this work. We provide a formal definition of the GraphQL language. We study the computational complexity of this language. And let me already tell you that this language admits really efficient evaluation methods, which, in other words, means from a complexity point of view, it's a very nice language. I guess you all know this, but here you have formal proof. <laughs> <laughs> all right? So, and then we also uh, provide a new solution to the problem of potentially large results. So I will go over these points now one by one, and I will start with the formalization. And again, some motivation, you may ask me, why do we need a formalization of GraphQL? Um, there's the spec. What's, what's the problem with the spec? Isn't this sufficient? Um, I don't know how many of you read the spec. It actually does a very good job of specifying several aspects of the language. The way it does it is based on a recursive procedure um, with lots of different subroutines that call each other and that kind of define the different um, features of the language. So, for instance, uh, you have some part of the spec which gives you a pseudocode uh, that uh, specifies how to deal with selection sets, and in this pseudocode you find somewhere um, a call to another uh, subroutine execute field, which kind of uh, gives you here, I have the uh, pseudocode that tells you how to deal with fields, and in this one again you have another call to a subroutine which is resolve field value, um, which brings you this pseudocode, which is these two lines that you see here at the bottom, and I magnified them for you. This is um, this method or this kind of uh, subroutine is the um, base step of the whole recursive procedure. So this we have to look at a bit more carefully. The way this is defined is basically we assume there is some internal function referred to as a resolver, and then we simply call this function. And what we get back is the result that we return. <coughs> All right, so I completely understand why it has been defined like that. Simply to allow the flexibility of supporting GraphQL on top of any kind of uh, database backend. But from the point of formalizing this, and in particular from the point of studying the language formally, this is not sufficient. We need a formal definition that in particular also gives us a formal, well-defined notion of what the base case of the whole recursion is. So we started out to do exactly this, and in order to define uh, also what the base case is doing, we first of all need a formal definition of the data uh, that uh, you are querying with a GraphQL query. And again, I mean, there's this flexibility of supporting any type of backend. Uh, but we, as we have heard exactly in the previous talk, kind of uh, the type of data that you, or the form of data that you can query always takes the form of a graph. So what we did is we formalized a notion of a GraphQL graph. And I don't show you the formalism here. I show you an example of an illustration of such a graph, which is uh, one of these well-known examples with a um, 
Star Wars data. And you see there are a couple of features in this, in this uh, abstract data model that we have. First of all, we have typed nodes. There's always one special node, which is the one for the query node. Okay. Um, the nodes have properties, which are key value pairs that kind of correspond to the fields with Scala values. Um, and then the edges, they also have properties, which are labels that correspond to um, field names again. And then optionally, you also have a set of key value pairs again, which kind of correspond to arguments with concrete values. Okay. For those of you who are familiar with graph databases like Neo4j and Tinkerpop, this is uh, kind of very similar to a property graph model. Okay. So on top of this, we also formalize the notion of GraphQL schema, and we define formally uh, what schema satisfaction means uh, based on these types of graphs. And now once we have defined what these graphs, graphs are, we can start formalizing uh, the query language and define exactly what is the expected result for every possible query over every possible of these types of graphs. Again, I don't show you the formalism. I, I have a couple of slides to kind of demonstrate how this definition works, but in the interest of time, let me just skip over this. Um, and instead, let's jump to our analysis that we did once we had all of these formalisms in place. And the first type of thing that we analyzed was what is called the evaluation problem in database theory. But again, I will skip over this because this is mostly for theoretical interest. Only for those of you who are familiar with some of this terminology, I only want to tell you, we proved that the, graph, the evaluation problem for GraphQL is NL complete. NL is a very uh, low complexity class. And here on the slide, I also show you um, some of the other well-known languages and in which complexity classes they are with respect to the evaluation problem. But let's jump to something more practical which is the enumeration problem, which is a problem that deals with um, how difficult is it to produce the complete result for a query. And in order to study this for GraphQL, we had to make our lives a little bit easier. We focused on a class of GraphQL queries, but this is not a limitation, as you will see in a second. So this graph of queries that we focused on, we call them non-redundant queries in ground-typed normal form. Sounds weird, but let me give you the intuition of what this is. First of all, non-redundancy. Here on the left-hand side, you see a GraphQL query, which is a valid query according to the spec, but notice there is some repetition in this query. So for instance, the name field for the hero repeats, and then also the friends field repeats with different uh, subfields. All right. If you would now uh, go and naively try to produce the result for this based on the example data that we have seen before, we may produce something like what you see here on the right hand side, and there is the same repetition. So you see that now uh, name Luke, name Luke appears twice, and similarly we have the friends field twice, uh, once with the names, once with the IDs. This is not a valid result according to the GraphQL spec. According to the GraphQL spec, there, there is a notion of field collection. So you basically have to merge the fields that have the same names. And the corresponding correct field is essentially this. You have to get rid of having name Luke twice, and you have to merge the friends uh, fields with the subfield uh, with the sub objects, um, as we see here. Um, now, you can kind of get rid of this problem by already doing this field collection in the query. So we can get rid of this redundancy already in the query. And these queries, uh, which basically uh, do the field collection already on the queries, uh, we call them non-redundant queries. There's another uh, complication, which are type restrictions, which you may have um, whenever you have these uh, inline fragments. Okay, so in this query, again, on the left-hand side, it's a valid GraphQL query. And you see there's a bit of repetition, because for the droids, uh, we want to see the name. But then also for everybody, we want to see the name. Again, if you would produce a result native, uh, naively, then for R2D2, we would have the name twice, which again is not a correct result. The correct result is to get rid of this duplication. So for those of you who are implementing GraphQL servers, make sure that your um, system, that your, that, that your implementation uh, works correctly according to all of this. So again, we can, uh, by knowing that friends in this particular case can only be droids and humans, 
droids or humans, we can uh, again get rid of this problem by moving the name, the separate name field into the human. And this gives us uh, another valid query which produces exactly the same result. And we call these queries who have this property, we call them ground typed. Okay? Now, the good thing is we prove some rewriting rules based on which you can take any arbitrary GraphQL query. You apply these rewriting rules and you end up with another query that we call Q prime here. This query is non-redundant. It is in ground type normal form, and it is semantically equivalent to the query that you started from, which means you're guaranteed to get the same result when you use this uh, rewritten query as you would get with the original query. And the advantage, of course, is that uh, you don't have to do the field collection anymore for the queries who have these properties. Okay? So now we can come back to the enumeration problem. And what we show here is for these uh, queries who are non-redundant and in ground type normal form, that for these ones, the result of them can be produced symbol by symbol with a constant time delay between every symbol that you produce. This is a very nice property. This is something that basically is kind of like the best that you can have for query languages. And this is not a property that many query languages have. Okay. And then from this, from this one, we can also derive that the time that it, it requires to produce the complete result depends linearly on the size of the result. This, again, is a very positive uh, finding for GraphQL, which is something you don't have for many other query languages. So as I said, there are really a lot of nice positive things, and it's a very nice language. There's only one caveat here. The dependency is on the size of the result. OK, so let's talk about result size. And I guess, as most of you know, results of GraphQL queries can be huge in some cases. I have a simple example here for you. Assume this is the graph representation of the data that we want to query. On the left-hand side, the node, that's the query node. And then uh, the blue line, this is uh, our query. In the query, we kind of nest uh, pairs of nose nose fields. Okay? If uh, we nest pairs n times, then the result for this query over this uh, graph will contain the string alice 2 to the power of n times, which means that the result size is exponential in the size of the query that you start from. So even if you can, in linear time, in the size of the result, you can produce it, it is exponential in the size of the query. So basically, we have a problem here. It's, it's a very um, expensive thing to produce this result. And in fact, this is not just a theoretical problem. I did some experiments with the public GitHub API um, where I executed similar types of queries with like uh, multiple levels of nesting. And here you see uh, kind of the measurements that I got. Um, the way to read these charts is all these uh, left bars, they represent the result size. And you see the result size with multiple levels of nesting increases exponentially, as expected. And similarly, the right-hand side bars, the gray ones, uh, they show us uh, the execution time in seconds. And again, you see the execution time also increases exponentially. And furthermore, once we come to a nesting level of 6 or 7, um, what happens is that I send the query to the GitHub API. I wait for roughly 10 seconds, and then uh, the API comes back and, and gives me an error and tells me that this query is too expensive. So I know there are a lot of approaches for dealing with this problem. And the GitHub API also implements some of these. So they have a restriction on how deep you can nest your queries. They have another restriction on the maximum possible fan out that you can have on every level of the um, tree of the query result. Um, but even with all of this, all of this is just based on the syntax and it's just based on heuristics and does not look into uh, the data. Right? So even with all of these uh, safeguards in place, I managed to find a query uh, that the GitHub API starts to execute and only after some threshold of time, uh, times out and realizes, OK, no, hoops, this is, this is uh, too expensive. All right? So we have a new solution to this problem. Um, and first of all, what we show is that for queries who are non-redundant and in ground type normal form, the time it requires to compute the size of the result without computing the result uh, of a query over a graph G uh, depends linearly 
on the product of the size of the query times the size of the data. So we have a linear dependency on the input. This is very good. And the way we prove this, and this you will love, is by giving an actual algorithm which achieves this uh, complexity bound. And so I will use the rest of the time uh, to show you, based on example, how the algorithm works. Um, I will use another uh, graph now that we query. Again, on the left-hand side, you have the query uh, node. The blue line is our query. You see it has uh, this, like the start um, field, and then it has two subqueries. And what we want to compute, essentially, is here you see at the bottom the size of this query when started to execute this query at the query node R. Okay? And the way we measure the size is basically based on the number of symbols that the result will have. And symbols can be every field name counts as one symbol, every scalar value counts as one symbol, and then all of these uh, kind of special characters also count as one symbol. And from looking at the query, we already know that uh, the size will contain at least, at least four symbols, the start, the colon, the opening uh, curly brace, and the end of the curly brace. And then in between, we may have more symbols coming from the two subqueries. Okay? So basically, we can say the size is 4 plus the size of uh, the subquery plus the size of the second subquery. So now we basically have to figure out what are the sizes uh, of the subqueries when evaluated at the second node, at the U node. Okay? Um, let's focus on the first subquery. And for this one, again, we know that the size of this result for the subquery will again be 4 symbols plus the size of the uh, subquery that it contains. So we have to go one step more. And then we see, OK, again, the size of this blue subquery now will be 4 plus the size of the subquery name. Again, we go into the recursion. And now we see that uh, the size of the name field in the query uh, will be exactly 3, because now we are at the node W. And uh, we know the size of the result is just name colon UCH. Okay? So what we do now at this point is we know we now label the node W um, with the size that the subquery, this given subquery, will have at this node. Okay, and that's important that we that we label them. Now we can go back. We use three to compute the size um, of the uh, containing subquery. So we have seven, and again we label the corresponding node. And we can go back one more step, and we can now compute uh, the size uh, of uh, the first subquery, uh, which is 11, and again, we label the corresponding node. Now we have dealt with the first subquery, we have to go to the second subquery, Q3, okay, which is this one. And again, we know the size will be 4 plus the size of the subquery. And now here comes the thing. Realize that this subquery is exactly the same as the subquery that we had in the other one. All right? and we already, and we also have to evaluate it from the same node V. And we have already labeled this node with the size that the subquery will have at this node. So therefore, we don't have to go into the recursion anymore. Instead, we just use the label, and we immediately know that the size will be 7. And that's the whole trick of the algorithm. This is why the algorithm achieves this uh, linear uh, complexity bound. We don't have to go into, into the recursion anymore, and therefore, we don't have to uh, be exponential. All right, so basically we now can compute 11 here, and this gives us then the final uh, size of the whole uh, result. So we can compute the resi result size in linear time, um, but we don't compute the result, of course. So now our proposal for building GraphQL servers is the following. Whenever a query comes in, you first compute the size of the result efficiently using our algorithm. Once you have this, if this size is beyond some, or be, be, uh, beyond some threshold, you simply reject the query. If not, you inform the size to the client, and then you start executing the query and produce the result byte by byte and send this to the client. Or as an alternative, uh, what you can also do, you can also use the size as, for, as a basis for some billing model, of course. So this was all I wanted to tell you, just in summary again. What we did is we formalized the language. For this, we have essentially introduced a formal definition of a property graph-like data model, which introduces this notion of GraphQL graph, 
and we introduced the formal definition of the query semantics. Then we studied the computational complexity. The evaluation problem is n complete. Uh, the enumeration of results is linear in the size of the query and the size of the database. And I showed you this nice efficient algorithm that allows us to compute the size of query results. So I will be around whenever whoever has questions about all of this stuff, um, just feel free. The slides that I skipped over, um, I will put them online so you can look at them in detail. Um, or, of course, you are also in, uh, invited to read the paper. 